That's what you want. You want to be able to hand it over to someone and be like, clean up my audio, please. Uh, <laughs> that'll be difficult. All right. Clean up my audio. Clean it all up. Yeah. Can you make me sound less Greek? <laughs> <laughs> then the un plugin plugin on, please. Yeah. yeah. Hello! Thanks for tuning in. This is a Delicious Legacy podcast. I'm Thomas Dinas and... I'm Stephen Saron. And we are going to talk to you about ancient food. Mainly ancient Greek food, maybe ancient Roman food, generally ancient cuisines, I think. Um, yeah, because um, it's a fun subject on a Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing else I'd rather do than sit in a booth with you, Tom. I'm glad. I'm really honored, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very fascinating topic. So, yeah, I don't think there's anything similar out there. No, I, I mean, I certainly haven't seen anyone really delving into the sort of things that motivate you when it comes to a lot of these ancient recipes and ancient foods. So, yeah, it's fascinating for me to sit here and be able to have a conversation with you about, about this sort of uh, culinary journey that you've been on and the things that motivate you. Indeed, yeah. Um, cheers for coming, anyway. Yeah, cheers to you. Uh, we're drinking beer, by the way. Not ancient beer. Not ancient beer, <laughs> which uh, that'll be a fascinating topic for yeah. another time. So, yeah, thank you for tuning in on our very first podcast. We are The Delicious Legacy, and we're going to talk about ancient food and gastronomy. What fascinates you? What uh, What do you want to talk about, really? Um, I, I think I think part of when it comes to a lot of the ancient foods, I mean, uh, most of my experiences with ancient food has been through you and through the pop-ups that you've done with the Philosopher's Stove. Um, up until that point, I'd say my amount of exposure to ancient foods consciously until mm. I think the first time I went to one of your nights, which was in the Mucky Pop, which I'm uh, going to guess... Yeah was goodness probably somewhere in the region of what would they be or 10, 2012 2013 something somewhere in there maybe a bit a bit later i think it was yeah. 2014 14 yeah yeah that was the first time and you know and that was the first time that was my first experience of really going to something with the intent of eating food that was attempting to replicate something like something uh, an yeah. ancient meal mm. um so yeah so most of my exposure to that would have been you know through coming to your supper clubs your pop-ups and the various different things that you've done um so yeah, I, I'm basically, I've been following your lead to a certain degree with a lot of this stuff. And mm. I'm more of, I've been more of a casual observer than um, someone who's really delved into a lot of these things with the exception of when we sort of talked about bread and whatnot. So yeah, yeah, again, yeah, another subject I think we can spend a whole, uh, yeah. a whole hour talking about uh, bread. One perhaps day. we will. <laughs> <laughs> One day. <laughs> One day. Um... Yeah, so where do we start, really? Um, I guess for, for me, Tom, something I've probably I've never even really asked is what kind of where did this all come from? Like, where did where did the interest in sort of ancient foods and where did that actually come from? Very much was a chance, a fortunate accident. I was working um, as a DJ, okay, <laughs> in a bar in my hometown in Veria in Greece. Okay. So I was working at that bar, which um, also had summer bar. It was summer, so open, um, overlooking um, the big um, plains that we have in uh, in Varia. So it was kind of amphitheatrical. Uh, so yeah, uh, attached attached to the bar was also a restaurant. Okay. With the same, which was open in the daytime, evenings, and so on. And obviously, in the night, at three o'clock in the night. Three o'clock in the morning, let's say. Yeah, <laughs> it was just um, me, the barman, and a couple of other people, maybe a couple of customers, whatever. So it was pretty empty. So I could go to the restaurant and go up and down, and you know, curiosity basically. And I think I chanced upon um, a folder with a book in it, mm -hmm. which was uh, in, in the in the actual kitchen or outside the kitchen. I don't remember exactly. It's been many years now. Okay. Uh, yeah, a book uh, written by Sally Granger and um, Andrew Dalby, 
both uh, uh, historians, archaeologists, food historians, uh, about um, ancient food. So it was called the it was called uh, the ancient cookbook. Okay. Um, that was uh, in Greece, as I said, and that was translated in Greek. Okay. So I saw the book, and um, just fascinated me because, I, as you know, I always liked cooking. Sure, but so at this point, like in terms of what you were doing, obviously, you say you're DJing, but at, at this point, had you been cooking professionally in any way, or? Um, like, just feeding friends. Like the, yes, most, the biggest critics you can possibly yeah, feed. Yeah, feeding friends, okay. especially. Right, right. Yeah. So it was after the, just finished university, mm -hmm. and I was back in my hometown for summer and thinking what to do in, in my life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was DJing, and I saw that book, and basically, yeah, I was very intrigued, to be honest. So I took the book, and I copied um, a few pages out of it. Okay. Just to learn to learn more about about stuff. So it was. So I think I copied the first few pages with the introduction about ingredients and um, you know herbs, spices, and the history about stuff. Okay, so I mean that's quite that's quite interesting because you know it's not something that certainly in the people that I've spoken to and come across, it's not something that I've seen a lot of people gravitate towards. So it's interesting that that caught your eye, you know, as you were sort of just wandering and you see this book and it caught your eye. Do you remember specifically what it was about the ancient foods that you were like, wow, this is actually really exciting? Was it some of the ingredients? Was it the challenge? Like, what was it that... It was certainly the ingredients. So a lot of the ingredients were very unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. um, so there was things like uh, garum, mm -hmm. which... We, we use that word in modern Greek, but for a completely different thing, for yeah. the brine, basically. Okay. So salt and water okay. um, solution. But yeah, reading about the ancient garum is a completely different thing. A fish sauce, but very complex in that respect. So things like that, or uh, the herbs, like um, silphium or uh, rue, fennel, and so on, which we don't cumin, coriander, which in modern Greek cuisine, you don't you don't really use it. The spices uh, like uh, cumin and coriander are of course more common now, but back in uh, 2002, when I discovered the book, uh, weren't so commonly used. Apart, of course, uh, from recipes uh, from Greeks uh, of uh, Middle Eastern uh, and uh, Minor Asia origin, of course. Okay. So it was all these ingredients which they were very unfamiliar with the modern Greek cuisine. Okay. Some of them are known completely, uh, so that challenge was there too. Right, right. And um, also, yeah, the taste, I, would, I was kind of wondering what what could that food taste like. Mm -hmm. So I think I copied a couple of recipes which were easy to find, like a salad. Okay. It was a salad, um, Roman salad, in fact, with uh, sweet breads and chicken and bread. Okay. And um, yeah, sauce made with wine, honey, garum, and so on. Yeah. So yeah, it was a... Salad. It was um, it was like I started with olives, uh, like a, um, olive relish. Uh, that was it with fennel and wine vinegar and cumin seeds and this and that. A fish dish that I saw um, with a um, with a herb crust, with okay. fresh herbs. Okay. So I copied some easy recipes, uh, which were also very unfamiliar, and um, I was <laughs> I was uh, experimenting with them. With my friends, basically, okay. or on my friends. <laughs> yes, which is always the best way to do things. One of the most, so one of the most challenging and weird ones was um, one with a sea bream covered in cheese, basically. Okay. Yeah, that was one of the things that you don't see. No, there's a lot of people who run away from from that, uh, that combination. combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And how was that? It's good because it, it's. Um, it's a very unusual thing, but it's definitely tasty and it works well. Yeah. It's definitely working well. Uh, remember, what was the cheese? That, what? Um, some kind of hard ship's cheese, like, okay. or use, use from used milk cheese. So okay. things like a pecorino, sure. like a hard pecorino from Sardinia or, you know, Romano or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting. And you, the recipe was describing something like um, you make a crust with this so you you make you mix it with olive oil and uh, cumin i believe and you make like a crust around the fish 
so trying to replicate that and making that sure. trust stay without melting away. Yeah. It was always a very interesting thing to try and do it. Never worked, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be like half the challenge when you st- look through a lot of these recipes because, you know, their way of describing how to do something for them might have been just common sense at the time. Yeah. Whereas where we are now, it wouldn't necessarily be common sense. Everything's changed and moved so much. So that's got to be an interesting thing to try to get into the mind of the person who's written the recipe and try to get into the times. Certainly. And figure out how to make that work, basically. Yeah, there are two two things. There are two things here now. One is that um, all the ancient recipes that we, they survived till now, uh, they're either through medical writers. Mm-hmm. So they're talking about health and right, uh, right. health benefits of food and certain foods. Yep. Or through one or two writers from the Roman era, okay. but a late Roman period. So okay. after the empire, I think, so 300 AD. Okay. Uh, all the recipes we have from them, um, they're very brief in a way. Okay. They don't, uh, they don't mention uh, quantities. Right. So because they were, uh, they were for slaves, so the cooks usually were slaves. Okay. So they knew what you cook for the masters or for the banquets and uh, symposiums and so on. Mm-hmm. So the slave will just need the ingredients, a list of ingredients, and then that will be adapted according to the, how many people and the tastes of their masters okay. and so on. That was going to be one of my questions because I would have thought the only need for recipes in that particular era would have been more sort of functions and for maybe the upper class type people who Indeed, yeah. you would need, who the people who could afford to have a cook. Like you say, to cater to the whims of whoever the master of the house was. Yeah. So to that end, a lot of the sort of regional foods and the average man's foods would potentially be lost. Uh, yeah. There'd we'd be no need to record that. No need to record in a way and no need. Probably the average man wouldn't have the means to, to eat something complicated. and. Yeah, true. Yeah. And exotic in that sense, mm. <laughs> yeah. It has to be always upper classes, yeah, and uh, nobility or very rich merchants and so on. But so yeah, the second point of that was that um, it's a two point one in that respect because mm-hmm. I said the late Roman recipes mm-hmm. and the slaves. Um, it was that um, from uh, the Hellenistic era, so the Greek, the what uh, what what we have survived from the Greek era. Mm-hmm. There were recipes actually, but um, a lot of it was uh, it was read in symposiums, so like an entertainment thing. So okay. there, w- there will be a play or a comedy or something happening during the symposium, okay. which is uh, a meal for again upper class rich Athenians mainly. That yep. they went, the sat and ate, and then there will be there would be some entertainment. Okay. So in that entertainment, it will be stories about food, about travels, about drinks, about people cooking, trying to impress their friends. Okay, yeah, right, right, right. So in, uh, through plays, especially yeah. comedies, we have surviving morsels of um, uh, of well, food and recipes, yeah, perhaps. Like in a way. ideas more than recipes. Exactly. More there experiences. Were experiences, you have experiences right. but where I suppose pretty much every Mediterranean country enjoys to sit and talk about food for hours, you know, yeah. they will sit and dissect a dish over a table. So... It's as much a conversation as it is a sort of ballpark recipe to how to make something, but yeah. maybe in an incredulous way, like, can you believe they put that with this? Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of that. And uh, yeah, subsequently I found this um, guy called uh, Archestratus, one of one of the very f- famous ancient Greek um, gourmands, basically. Mm-hmm. So actually he was the very first gourmand in that stuff. He okay. was. He, in a way, he was the father of gastronomy. So he traveled across the known world mm-hmm. seeking pleasures okay. <laughs> through food. So, yeah, he would go to all the places. He was from Sicily. Okay. And, yeah, he would travel all across through the Mediterranean and try local ingredients, um, you know, the local, the local cuisine, go throughout the Black Sea and try the freshest fish, talk about the best wines, where do they come from, the best breads, who makes the best breads, with what wheat is the best to sure. make what kind of bread. It so sounds like your dream job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I could travel through time as well, so yeah. I can uh, okay. taste what they tasted. Sure, sure. That will be even dreamier. <laughs> 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 we can only but uh, 
uh, yeah, imagine. Sadly, the writings of Archestratus, uh, they haven't uh, survived through the millennia to our age. Uh, his books and words are lost. We have only passing comments uh, through other people's works. So, for example, uh, we have comedies and plays from ancient Athens, and we have passages that are mentioned um, in there from uh, from his lost books, okay. basically. Okay. That's basically, I guess, answering what uh, how how we know about about the ancient um, cooking and recipes. So yeah, just it leaves a lot, I suppose, to common sense and intuition. You, like you say, you have to kind of maybe get in the headspace a little bit about where they would have been and what would have been going on to try to feel out where maybe some of these recipes will take you because just due to the sort of vagueness of maybe some of what you're having to deal with as a source material. Interesting. Interesting, Tom. I don't think we, we haven't actually really sat down. We've talked about some of this, but we haven't really sat down and gone through a lot of the sort of stuff behind. Yeah, Archestratus, as we said, Archestratus was one of the first... Um, Gourmands. He yes. was a traveler. He was a writer. He was he was a gastronomer. Basically, he was the inventor of the gastronomy in a sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, while um, a lot of the recipes we have for cooks that were slaves, yeah, there was always an element of, uh, of competition and of of people um, in, in the Hellenic world. In a sense, the, the chef was actually a bit more like the modern chef in a way there is a passage okay we can find it we can we have a passage um that says anyone can prepare dishes carve boil up sauces and blow on the fire even a mere commis but the chef is something else to understand the place the season the man giving the meal the guest when and what fish to buy that is not a job for just anyone. You will get the same kind of thing just about all the time, but you will not get the same perfection in the dishes or the same flavor. Archestratus has written his book and he and is held in esteem by some as if he said something useful, but he's ignorant of most things and tells us nothing. Wow. So, uh, you have... There's an opinion there. There's an opinion. And you have uh, chefs with egos, and you have chefs that competing, and yeah. in a sense, on the very on that very small fragment that survives, you can see that um, there were also professional chefs, not only slaves. Yeah, and they were competing with each other. Yeah, and with the predecessors, and they were trying to create a, a name and a fame for them. I like I like when you sort of see those echoes of things. That have happened before and you can see them sort of happening now because i'm you know that's very much a case of where we are now when it comes to a lot of food like chefs are sort of modern day rock stars almost you know they are yeah and um you know you, you can imagine at that particular time you, you can imagine it being similar going but going back to there you know what it must have been like for some of these chefs who you know they knew where to get the best fish or they knew you know, they knew how to do certain flavor combinations that were just blowing people's minds, you know. And uh, what those what those experiences must have been like. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. I, I need to st- start looking more into fragments that survived. Yeah. There must be passages there of, uh, of gossip, basically, between chefs. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> It's an interesting point, though, um, that you sort of touched on. Um, you know, because probably the the average peasant food, the day-to-day food, there would have been not a lot of requirement to write that down. No, yeah, not it, at all. That's not going to be the kind of thing that's going to have survived all this time, other than possibly with a little bit of adjustment for modern ingredients, but it could be very similar to what we eat nowadays. Some Some dishes nowadays could be virtually unchanged. Yeah, and uh, the other important thing that we need to remember, not obviously the very poor and the peasants and so on, uh, which were a lot more back then, mm-hmm. they didn't have their own kitchen. Right. So you, you couldn't really actually cook for yourself or your family per se. So either that was a more a communal thing or, yeah, you had your fireplace perhaps and a pot over the fireplace and you just had you just threw things into the pot just to cook them and eat them so there was no 
that sense of trying to create something flashy and fancy and try new ingredients after, all the time. After a day in the office, <laughs> Ian just pop down the food market yeah. and uh, whip up whip up some nice sort of yeah. meal for yourself. I think people who were, who were toiling in the earth, you know, all day long. Yeah. yeah. It was basically, you had a very big breakfast, I suppose, something like breakfast with, but it was mostly, you know, fruits, nuts, olives, onion, this kind of stuff stuff like more raw more ready snacks in a, in a sense okay and then yeah you would have a stew at home or you would buy bread from the from the from the baker yeah because there were no home home bakeries <laughs> you, yeah. no, we, not, you would have an oven potentially you would, at home. yeah you you don't there's no ovens as such in the yeah. in the ancient home yeah yeah so i guess this is this becomes much much more of a sociological question because then you have to start looking into land ownership and um, you know, the, the sort of just the makeup of how people sort of existed at that time in terms of, you know, were you working for the landowner um, or did you have your own land? Because I imagine that would be different. You know, if you didn't own your land, whatever you grew, presumably you'd be growing for the benefit of the person who, who owned the land. So this, mm. would, this would influence your day-to-day -day eating, you know, and just how society would interact. So I presume... Some of that probably research goes into some of these yeah, dishes. Yeah. And of course, um, yeah, there's archaeologists and historians who know a lot more about that side, that yeah. aspect of, of, uh, of the social life and everyday life of ancient people, which, yeah. again, when I'm trying to do something, recreate a dish, sometimes I just look at the ingredients and sometimes you have to actually invest a lot of time and listen to people who invested their lives <laughs> yeah. on that on that aspect. So there are historians that have been studying this thing for decades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean and that, and that makes sense. You know, you you in a way because some of these recipes are so vague, you need to understand the situation. You need to understand what the times were like. Yes. If your interest is trying to get a ways towards recreating what people previously had at the same time i know what you're trying to do you're also trying to take some of these limitations as it were of trying to limit yourself to what was available at the time and put your own twist your own spin because obviously you know you're a cook in your own right and you're trying to create your own style of food as well so you're kind of doing a couple of different things at one time you're not you yourself are not calling yourself a food historian you know oh yeah you're tapping yeah. you're tapping into uh, history as inspiration and you're trying to limit yourself to a degree with what ha they had historically but then you're funneling it through who you are as a as a cook as a chef yes exactly so i had the that photocopies from the book mm -hmm. and i was experimenting with my friends and family yep and um, yeah that was happening for for years i guess i think the stuff in the book Whereas they seem a bit more normal to me now, mm -hmm. they, they were a bit wacky in a way. So all these yeah. um, sauces and honey and wine and vinegar and fish sauce on the food. And so it was all these sweet and sour flavors and yeah. really strong flavors with meat and all these unknown vegetables. And how can you make them uh, palatable for the modern taste? Yeah. So it was always a play for me. Yeah. And... Then one day, we thought, why don't we try it as a as a bit more of a of a serious project? Yeah. Because in the meantime, I started cooking more. I've been through a few different jobs with with catering and food sometimes mm -hmm. during my during all these years in London. Yeah. And then, as you said, twenty fourteen. Yeah. Which was kind of the big years in, of crisis in Greece. Okay. The big financial crisis. Um, we were thinking of how we could do something that will um, promote a bit of, of grace in a positive way. That was right. I remember because you incorporated the olive oil into that. Yeah, into and the... actually try and help Greeks, Greek producers maybe. Mm -hmm. And so maybe how could we start a business that will uh, have a Greek product which is the essence of Greece. Mm -hmm. So like olive oil, extra mm -hmm. virgin olive oil, going into that world and exploring everything about olive oil, exploring the history of olive oil, the place you produce it, how it's produced, learning about olive oil and so on. 
um, led me to think, obviously, we need we need to use it mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in a case to, to make a showcase about the product, basically. So sure. food food is the way to do it. Yeah. And yeah, you can do modern Greek food or any other Mediterranean recipe or any other combo of <laughs> modern cuisine with mm-hmm. olive oil and food. But something unique, something like, you know, the USP, the USP yeah. of the of the brand. Yeah. So I thought, why not try ancient recipes yeah. to unsuspected, innocent Londoners? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense, especially you, at, at that point still, like a lot of the concept of supper clubs and things like that, although it had been happening for a little while, it was still relatively fresh. So you're sort of tapping into something that is still that a little bit fresh, bringing in the idea of, you know, the... Again, you were quite early on in, in that regard in terms of trying to introduce people to a producer in conjunction with the event that you're doing. So you see more and more of that now with wine tastings where they'll bring the winemaker over yes. and stuff. But you were bringing the olive oil producer over to talk about his olive oil and then tapping into this sort of food scene that was taking place. And then on top of that, trying to put your own twist on it, um, which was to then push yourself in a culinary sense to c- cook in an ancient sort of style so you you kind of it was a overload in a way when you consider by what most people are doing these days no one no one is half as ambitious as that in a way in terms of what you're doing for that first one yeah yeah i think uh i think maybe it was a bit over ambitious to begin with i i loved it i remember i still remember the conversation i had with the guy and I th- i'm pretty sure i bought a couple liters of olive oil from him as well it was good <laughs> good times <laughs> yeah so okay so that that, that that was and that was for me kind of almost circling background that was my first real introduction to the concepts of ancient food beyond whatever you sort of just casually pass mm. so that was the first time i saw something really targeted towards something like that and yeah and i do have a i mean i do have a passing interest in it not not quite as passionate as you are but um certainly um have a respect for a lot of the things that came from before us and where a lot of our traditions come from um so yeah for me this has been a fascinating journey to observe watching you progress because i've learned a lot through you know watching you go through this journey we did cook uh, a lot of stuff as well, well yeah, together I mean, yeah yeah i mean oh yeah but i mean i was never sitting in the driving seat you know i was always there as a very very happy full passenger <laughs> good good I think for me, one of the uh, one of the things that's interesting to observe, and you sort of touched on this earlier, is how how they approached a lot of the foods that they were making. And as you said, sort of looking at sour elements, looking at sweet elements, things that are not. I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to say they're not as common in modern cuisine in a way, but they're not as um, overt. They're not as obvious. You know, they really pushed the flavors a lot harder um, compared to a lot of modern Mediterranean food that is a bit more subtle, you know, it's a bit more... Yeah, I suppose they did. I guess with the modern Mediterranean, we go back to a lot of the peasant peasants' food. So we have simpler stuff. And that's a, that's a common thread throughout the Greek, Italian, Spanish, and, you know, Middle Eastern cuisine that mm-hmm. we have... Peasant food. Peasant, yeah. Uh, simple ingredients, uh, fresh, um, full of the, of the toil of the land, and you taste you taste that for, through the simplicity you, you have great flavors mm-hmm. so that's kind of the modern thing and yeah i think for most of the past two centuries a lot of the mediterranean people they experienced poverty mm-hmm. so through poverty comes innovation and you know you're trying to make the best out of a bad situation so yeah you 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 will create a delicious dish nowadays so whereas through the ancient writers and through the through what has survived, which is from the upper class again, and merchants, they want to impress their friends mm-hmm. or their rivals, <laughs> and uh, create extravagant dishes. Mostly the Romans, to be honest, uh, but also in the Hellenic period, uh, in the Hellenic times. So yeah, from from after Alexander the Great's conquest and subsequent death of uh, of the Persian Empire, you had all the wealth from the east. Okay. coming to, towards the West. And with the wealth comes new foods, mm-hmm. new vegetables, exotic birds, and of course, lots of money. And so lavish dishes of, and lavish excessive 
eating. So yeah, we have people trying to push boundaries mm -hmm. on that and create all these weird and big flavors. And of course, the spices, the trade of spices yes. uh, from the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. from India as well. So you had all this black pepper, black pepper and so on. Well, I mean, were, even assume would maybe things like cinnamon or... Uh, yeah, and ginger uh, coming uh, through Ethiopia and yeah, through through all these exotic places anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, people pushed their boundaries, cooking yeah. and using these ingredients plentiful, which uh, leads again back to Archestratus. Yeah, he was a gourmand and a gastronomer, mm -hmm. but he was he was deriding all these people that making too okay. big and complex sauces. Right. And we're masking the flavor of the of the of the good ingredients. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there is a, this fine balance that we can we can see it's common throughout the Mediterranean from the ancient years up to today. I think I yeah. think there there is a there is an element of both actually now. Yeah. But yeah, the flavors are very distinct. The the base flavors. I yeah. think even for the common man of ancient times, yeah, their routine in the food was different. So we can definitely say. They had both their flavors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was the one thing I'd, I'd say that was my first impression, first time tasting some of the dishes. Is it was more how bold a lot of the dishes were, and it was just a lot more. I wasn't expecting it. Um, I probably should have, but I just I wasn't really expecting it when uh, when I started tasting it, and it was a sort of yeah. a common theme through a lot of the different things that you did. You know, the flavors are a little bit more amplified, um, which has been that's been one of the more fascinating things for me to see how that how that all comes together and how you're still trying to strike a harmony with all these big flavors in, in a dish. But then you're also you know, you're having to use your intuition in terms of what you're doing and to try to also figure out what the palette, the flavor profile would have been of the time, you know, because you don't always have an exact recipe. And how do you know that whatever ingredient you have now has the same intensity as it might have had back then with less with different farming techniques and all the rest so there's a lot of assumption that goes into it so you're still having to create these harmonies in a dish uh, whilst trying to lean on your direction from hundreds of years ago yeah for sure <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely fascinating um not only to talk about it but yeah to actually cook and try and recreate something that um, that would please you for for the for the kind of the research reasons purposes mm -hmm. and also will be flavorsome and also a bit unique you know that that's I know it's a bit silly and superfluous in a way trying to ah, I'm gonna create something really unique <laughs> it's but it's like as a fun project really you know try try and use ingredients and techniques that not many people know so it's mostly about showing people a few other things that they can do with food i suppose mm -hmm. um yeah one of the things that fascinate that fascinated me was the challenge of cooking mediterranean food without the key mediterranean ingredients of of of, of the modern yes, cuisine that's like right, yeah. tomatoes yeah peppers yeah, peppers yeah uh, obviously rice there was no rice came later with the arabs so it came about a thousand years later from uh, from the, the period of the classical greece and the, the roman republic so it came a thousand years later. Um, rice, um, without potatoes, of course, mm -hmm. and um, corn. No corn again yeah. from Mexico. Yeah. For those who like it hot, chili. Chilies, yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff out there that they weren't known at all. Of course, they came from the New World, mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff that came from the East, from the Far East later a lot later mm -hmm. which now the staples of of the greek and the italian and the spanish diet and cuisine again very fascinating try to create a sauce without tomatoes yeah i know it's, uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i understand we, it, it, it would it would be i don't know i mean that's just that that taps more into my sort of food sensibilities so yeah it's uh yeah. it's a difficult one um one of the things i i remember having um, one of the first dishes that really stood out to me, um, I think it was on the second one that I went to of yours. Um, it was a prawn dish, and it, there was honey in the dish with the prawns, which was a combination that I never thought to put together. 
I just never would have thought to combine the two. I don't know why. Maybe to other people it's like very obvious. obvious. But for me, the the idea of taking um, an ingredient like a prawn, which is already naturally quite sweet, and then Mm. enhancing that sweetness with really high quality honey just hadn't occurred to me in the slightest. And then everything else that went on with the dish, obviously. But that was the thing for me. It's one of the things that grabbed me and uh, I was very intrigued by. Yeah, I still find it one of the most intriguing combinations. So you have the sweet honey and the f- fishy prawns, again, sweet by themselves in a mm-hmm. way. And also the simplicity. It takes very little to cook, very little time, very little effort in a way. Mm-hmm. Where did that recipe, which, I'm trying to remember which where that recipe actually came from. So was it something to do with, did you name it after Alexander? Was that, am I uh, No, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the names, well, we gave names to the recipes just because we thought it would be fun. Okay. Um, But yeah, the recipe, I think it's described in one of the poems, in one of the symposiums. So someone called Philoxenus, apparently someone called Philoxenus, he was describing to his lover some delicious dishes he had one day, something like that in Mm -hmm. in one of the banquets. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, he was talking about prawns, and honey-glazed prawns. Okay. With uh, fresh oregano. Yeah. So there was not even a recipe in a sense, in that in that uh, poem. Mm-hmm. Just um, yeah, someone was reminiscent of a, of a dinner that he had. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, from from that uh, I saw the recipe from uh, the book I told you about, mm-hmm. the classical cookbook, and uh, yeah, I tweaked it. I played with it. I try and make it a bit more of my own and a bit more modern in a sense, um, experimented with fresh oregano uh, or with dried oregano, um, fish sauce, of course, the the garum, a mm-hmm. uh, bit of that. And yeah, try, try and create something that will, um, yeah, that will make people pop people's mouth water. <laughs> yeah, well, it did. It still does, quite frankly. Um, it's one of those things, though, like, you know, you're eating it and you're loving it. For me, I would have loved to have been able to throw some chili in there, you know, and you can't if you're trying to sort of stay stay authentic. authentic. Yeah, but at, at the same time, you know, you can kind of, I guess, like, you can achieve a bit of spiciness if you add pepper or something maybe. Yeah, like you can lots get a of bit black of, pepper. Which, you can get some bite into it, Yeah, which is very reminiscent of, you know, Thai food and the origins of Thai food where a lot of their heat came from black pepper before chili was introduced to them. Mm, is that something you know? Because, uh, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. yeah. You know, that that's, I guess, how you get around it in a way. But, you know, it's that that's one of the f- sort of fun things about eating some of these ancient recipes is, you know, um, you're putting yourself back in time, but you're also maybe considering what you have available to you now. And Indeed, yeah. So... Um, I'm I sort of as as we're sort of talking through some of these things, just thinking about um, the levels of experimentation that you've gone to on your friends, um, you know, and you Poor know, souls. one of the oh, one of the positives <laughs> for me is to see that you haven't really lost many friends through it. So, you know, that's a good way of showing you that uh, you're doing something right at least. Um, but I guess you know, we covered we covered a fair amount of ground food wise in terms of the different pop-ups that took place mm. you know that you know you explored the ancient greeks the romans the celts um so you you kind of looked around quite a lot in terms of uh the different culinary inspirations did you find anyone specifically spoke to you directly like is the greek one the one that would speak to you more or did you find them all equally speaking to you or how, how did that come about I think the fun thing is uh, is the Romans, the ancient thing, the ancient Romans. That's the fun uh, part of it, trying to recreate the the, the big spectacular dishes, basically. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely something close to my heart. Uh, so ancient Romans, and of course the ancient Greek um, is always going to be there. It's yeah. always going to be one of the of the most close to my heart's uh, things. Um, I cannot, I cannot reject it or <laughs> put that aside. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think those two, those two things, they're always going to be 
on the top of my uh, interests trying to create the dishes and recreate the dishes and create create something new yeah. from ingredients and texts and even archaeological discoveries which still happen. Mm-hmm. In terms of the ingredients that you find fairly common um, looking through all the various different recipes and stories, um, was there anything in there that for you was particularly shocking or caught you your, like really caught your attention? I, I feel like I know the answer to this, but I'm going to let you go <laughs> shocking. anyway. Shocking. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it just caught you by surprise. Like I wasn't expecting to see that. Are we talking about ancient Greek uh, stuff or just, about just in general it, it, through your, through your travels through your culinary your ancient culinary travels? Has there been anything on your journey that you've looked at and you went, "That's interesting. That's surprising. I wasn't really expecting to see that that combination together." Crikey, yeah, um, there is, there is actually. I don't know why, but that's, uh, one of the dishes which was patina with seafood. Mm-hmm. I don't know why that was one of the things that. Kind of caught my eye initially. Oh, that that sounded unusual. Yeah. Then again, I don't have much experience with, um, you know, Far Eastern cuisine like Thai and Filipino and so on. So I think the more I progressed and learned about other cuisines, it seems it seems actually quite normal thing that they would eat in, okay. the, in the Far East. Yeah. Um, so something like that, um, or. Or obviously the use of um, olive oil in more sweet uh, okay. elements. So right. yeah, because they wouldn't use butter in a sense. Everything was with olive oil. Okay. What was your thought? What did you think? That I thought you were going to go to garum. I thought that was going to be as an ingredient. Yeah, as an ingredient. A, yeah. As something that you discovered and you went, oh, I like a little bit of this. Like, uh, yeah. Um, Bathe in it. <laughs> <laughs> Garum. Um, maybe we should explain a little bit about garum here. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. Like in a way that that for you is, I know it's a subject that you're fairly close to, so I'm not sure if that's uh, like an, almost an episode in its own right. But yeah, I mean, by all yeah, means. yeah, we, we, we could spend a, a good hour talking about garum. Yeah, but in a sense, garum is a, a ferment fermented um, fish um, sauce in a, in a way made by. Fresh fish that they were left with lots of salt to to become liquid in a sense in uh, barrels under the hot Mediterranean sun. And while that sounds disgusting in a way, and you can imagine the smell in a yeah. in a thirty five degrees <laughs> Celsius for three months. Yeah. But this is something that um, at the end the, of the process you get a very intense uh, sauce which you can use as a condiment. On the table, in um, the place of salt. Yeah, I'll make a little um, digression here, a small point about garum, uh, which we then we're going to expand in another episode. Uh, basically, one could buy a lit black garum, which is expensive and intensely flavored blood sauce. Um, this would be lost in the cooking process and wasted as such. Um, so this was used as, an, as a table condiment by the guest or by the host uh, themselves. So, yeah. Tasty black garum. I, um, I, I have to try to wonder what the situation would have been where someone thought, I I'll really want to eat this. I will eat this. And yeah. I, I can only assume that alcohol was involved. <laughs> it had to be someone coming home from a night out at some friends, had a little bit too much wine, and they just explored that sort of very, I don't know, that, that weird bucket in the corner that they didn't really know what it was doing there. And uh, and then thought, this is amazing. Because no one sober would think to put that in their body. Could be. But that's the thing. Garum, to, to, say, to explain to our listeners. So garum is um, the equivalent of the Thai or the Vietnamese fish sauce that we have nowadays. Um, it's a very similar thing and a very similar process, basically. If you if you like Far Eastern cuisine, Thai cuisine and Vietnamese cuisine, then they all have fish sauce and you all eat it whether you know it or not. And yeah, it's intense as, a, as an ingredient and hence that's why you use a little bit of it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, garum, garum is a subject on its own. I think we'll come back to it yeah, one yeah. day. Look forward to that. 
Um, yeah, so that was, but that was the one that I thought, I thought that was going to be the one that was going to uh, have piqued your interest. Um, in terms of the, the ancient foods that are out there and the, the various different sort of journeys you've been on, obviously we've covered some of your favorite things that you've discovered along the way. So is there anything you've really enjoyed cooking? Like, is there one dish that you're like, when you had an opportunity to present that to people in whatever the context that it was, you were just like, yeah, I feel like I've really tapped into something here and this is amazing. So, um, we talked about the fish with the pecorino yeah. cheese um, crust, which, um, because it's so difficult to actually recreate the exact uh, description from the ancient writers. Um, I haven't done it uh, apart from uh, in small dinner parties for a couple of friends, like, yeah. you know. So I haven't done it in a more uh, actual pop up uh, situation. But the thing that I really love cooking, and it's so fascinating, and it's I've done it many times. It's uh, the smoked pork okay. on uh, grape, honey, and wine sauce. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think to answer your question, that's my favorite recipe and yeah. my favorite thing to cook. That's probably one of my favorite ones that I've eaten. Another one I was thinking about was the pork dish. Um, when you were working out that pork dish with the apples and we sort of did a, a little trial at my house to kind of put some of the dish together. But I yeah. remember when I actually saw that come together on a plate at one of your nights, that was nice because I had been more involved with that specific dish than otherwise. But also mm. just the flavors. I mean, they're classic flavors. They're classic yeah. flavors anyway for Pork now. Pork and apple yeah. and lick. Exactly. But it was just, it's just, it's taking those classic flavors, but it's presenting them. It's like there's different accents in the dish, mm. which are more in keeping with the time that they came from and the flavors that people enjoyed more at that time, especially when you consider what would be like a celebration dish. Yeah. Uh, yeah, true, true. That was that was one very interesting dish, and it was a bit more complex in mm. a way. Well, there's some, you had, for that one, you had a lot of different elements. Yeah, because it was coming with meatballs as mm-hmm. well. So you had meatballs, you had the pork with the apples and the licks and the wine sauce. So yeah, it was it was one of the, one of the things that we definitely need to, to do again. Um, I wouldn't say no. Then I was thinking about some of the different things that I've had of, of yours over the time. The prawn dish and that pork dish were the two that really jumped out at me. Yeah. Um, that are the ones that I remember eating and just being like, I mean, there, there's been a lot of really delicious things, but those were the two that really caught my attention when I had them. The smoked pork. Uh, oh, that's, that's, that's a different beast in its own right. That was... Yeah. Mm, I think that's out there because obviously smoke, smoking and salting was a technique to preserve stuff. Uh, they didn't have fridges. Um, the recipe requires smoked pork or salted pork in that sense. So this is um, this is a very fascinating story. This recipe was found in Egypt. So the time after Alexander the Great's conquest, mm-hmm. uh, Egypt was part of uh, the broader... Hellenic world. Yep. Um, so ancient Egypt for the next 300, 400 years, apart from the Romans, Greeks had very big influence. The Greek rulers were part of them, higher class of citizens, mm-hmm. um, and the rulers in a way of Egypt. So there was a lot of, of lot of Greek stuff happening there. So this recipe was found in a in a pile of um, rubbish, basically, in a, in a scrapyard okay. in, in a sense along with other letters from from that era. Okay. So it was found in a papyrus. Mm-hmm. So we found ancient papyri with um, letters exchanged between friends or contracts or, you know, all the things that you can find nowadays. Mm. Okay. But uh, from ancient Hellenic Egypt and Roman, of course, la- later on. So the, th- the thing is that the, papy- the papyri survived because of the heat and the dry climate. Okay. And they were buried under tons of soil and sand, I guess. Yeah. Um, so the archaeologists that they went through through them, they found this recipe in, uh, I think the, the city is called Oxyrhynchus in ancient Egypt. They found uh, this recipe and it was, it was describing a dish with uh, smoked pork or salted pork. Mm-hmm. 
and with herbs uh, that we still use to this very day and go excellent with pork, of course. Um, you could be fooled that this is from a modern, high-end, fancy Spanish restaurant. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. So things like uh, thyme, mm-hmm. so we had fresh thyme, uh, cumin, uh, fennel seeds, mm-hmm. and um, a sauce made with um, a sauce made with honey, wine, vinegar, and uh, fresh grape juice. Okay. So you had white wine, white uh, grape juice, vinegar, honey, okay. and all these herbs. It's interesting these... that it sort of blend those three things together. Yeah. In terms of like having grapes in different stages. Yeah. <laughs> it's the grapes in different stages indeed, yeah. yeah. All this and the herbs and black pepper, of course. So yeah, that, that recipe really fascinated me. And uh, I thought how, how, yeah, how the smoked pork would work with all that, all the different sweet yeah. and spicy and aromatic stuff. So that was one of the first that I made. It was, yeah. I think, I developed it a little bit later on Yeah. over the years. It's yeah, a success. No, it, 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 still, very... it still stays. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I remember the last time I had it. I didn't have enough of it. That's why I remember the last time I had it. It's always the case with that, isn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we, we we should... Obviously, I would like to uh, get into more ancient civilizations than Greek and Roman. So, like the Egyptian, so mm-hmm. the, the ancient Egyptian stuff. Yeah. I'm sure because they were crazy with their uh, cataloging and writing everything down. So, we must have recipes or at least ingredients and descriptions of ingredients and foods from, from the era of the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. So maybe, you know, 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. So that would be an, an, another nice area to disc- for discovery for me. Yeah. And then, of course, um, the Mesopotamia. So ancient Babylon, Assyria, and Sumerian civilizations. Yeah. So that will be another place and time. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Which I, I haven't dis- explored, yeah. uh, so I'm sure there's plenty of stuff there. Yeah, I think that's a good introduction to to the world of ancient cooking. Really, it's a very good start. Excellent. I think it was a it was great. Well, yeah. thanks for inviting me, Tom. Um, You're welcome. It's a pleasure to sort of sit here and, you know, having known you as long as I've known you, um, we've had some conversations along these lines, but it's been more about discussing the actual dish, discussing the actual food of whatever you're trying to achieve on that particular occasion. So if you're hosting a night, we would be talking more about the specifics of the night and the food that was going into it. But to just sort of sit and have a chat about kind of seeing it through your eyes. This is my way of discovering it, is initially discovering it sort of through your eyes. Yeah, yeah, I think. And it's nice to sort of sit and talk through that and just understand it a little bit more. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you for that. I appreciate the invite. (laughs) You're welcome. I'd have rather you'd had some smoked pork here. I mean, and maybe that's a consideration for next time. You know, well, that's going to be the next time. Yeah, yeah. uh, Smoked pork. You know, um, yeah. Maybe that's a consideration for next time. Get some ancient meats going on. But, but yeah, um, it was nice to have the opportunity to talk through some of these things a little bit more and just get a bit more of uh, understanding in terms of where a lot of this started for you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you to anyone who's listened. And thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope uh, you'll stay tuned for the next episode when we when we will talk more about ancient food. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.